Hey guys, welcome back to Real Housewives Recaps. Today, we're doing commentary, or one that we love to hate, or not even that, just the annoying one is back, aka Michael Patrick King. And he did a commentary on the Change of Address. It was season four, episode 15, Change of Address. And remember, this is the one where Carrie and Aiden, well, you can see the picture <laughs> by the fountain, famous episode. Also, Miranda is having a boy, boy, oh boy. So I thought we could take a listen together to his commentary track and you know how I do it. I'll pause. I'll interject my thoughts. I want to hear your thoughts in the comments. Uh, if this is your first one listening to, he watches the episode. So you don't, we don't get to see that. So we just kind of listen in. And then again, I interject and talk about what we want to talk about. Or find me on Patreon. It's patreon.com backslash Real Housewives Recaps. Okay, me again. He starts talking in the opening music. I can't play music because of copyright purposes. So I'll just tell you that he calls this a controversial episode. Because we all know, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, stop now, go watch. But we know what happens. This is the episode where Carrie and Aiden break up. But we don't find out that they have broken up until the last line of the episode. Aiden just said, or... She says in a voiceover that Aiden moved out the next day. So, yeah. Yikes. Rough way. Rough way to find out. Okay, let's jump in. Charlotte's freshly out of her marriage, and we decided that the way to do Charlotte was not to put her into a depression as she had suffered greatly in the marriage. So we were looking for something people do, sponge painting, ceramics, silly things. And one day Julie, one of the writers, said, like, you know, take a tap class. So we thought... Well, that's bizarre, because Julie taps, so we thought Charlotte tapping would be hilarious. In the Carrie Aiden arc at this point, we've already set up the fact that she said yes to getting married, but in the last episode prior to this, we could see that she was getting uncomfortable about that role. We needed to bring somebody in to reflect information that she hadn't told them. That's Susan Sharon, played by Molly Price, who you may recognize as one of the cops from Third Watch. Here she plays an obnoxious Barney's buyer. The reason we brought her in was for Carrie to basically completely forget that she's engaged. So again, because we're listening and not watching, this is where she had all like a million stupid pearl necklaces. Remember, she's sitting at dinner with Aiden and Charlotte and Susan says, what's up with you? And she's like, not much. And Charlotte's like, Carrie, tell her the most important part, meaning Carrie, don't forget you're engaged. Um, And Carrie had been hiding the necklace down her shirt, saying that she did that to keep it closer to her heart, but we know that that's bullshit. There's the traditional reaction, and if you look here, you'll see Carrie is not having it. She's embarrassed. We put the ring on a necklace to show that Carrie was trying desperately to find her way to be an engaged woman. The funny thing about this scene is that she completely hides it in pearls. It's not even the only thing. Look at John there. John Corbett there plays thank you. He acknowledges that it's uncomfortable that it's around her neck for him, but now he has a reason to let it be okay. The take on the Richard Samantha story, as you can see, is very 1930s. We had a feeling of like Mr. and Mrs. New York, very Preston Sergis, Max Senate comedy, the staircase, the whole elegant sort of Gene Harlowness of it all. So, of course, what he's talking about there is Richard's actual apartment where the stairs come in from either side and there's like a dramatic, you can see them sitting at the table at the bottom of these steps. It's kind of a cool visual thing that they did here. Uh, Samantha, of course, Richard's publicist, and she sees in the paper he's been canoodling (laughs) BB London. So she is not happy about that and calls up JJ. JJ Mitchell is played by Mark Grapey. An actor who did very, very well in a smaller part named J.J. in Where There's Smoke, which is the season three opener. He was really funny. We all thought he was a great guy on the show. And when we were looking for someone obnoxious to be her bane of existence in this episode, we thought, let's bring Mark back as J.J., one of the few returning characters on the show. Hey, believe me, I'd rather be talking out of your ass, Jonesy, so just say the word. Jonesy. J.J. Mitchell's column said you were canoodling with B.B. London. He's an idiot. Just giving you a heads up. We love the word canoodle. It was like in the paper, I think right around the time we were coming up with this episode, all of a sudden somebody had said somebody was canoodling and we thought it was funny to repeat and use. I just need to get all the facts so I can do my job. 
The struggle with Samantha in love is really a journey for us in the writing room because we wanted to show that she, like Carrie, is not in a tight fit. She doesn't know how to be monogamous. She doesn't know how to be jealous. So she's struggling with her own way to be in a relationship. So I know how this all goes down, no pun intended, with Richard. I do. But I gotta say, I liked Richard and Samantha. I, not so much this episode, and not the episode where he gets busted, but I did. I, I thought he was just a different kind of guy, and she's a different kind of girl, and they seem to be on similar pages about things, and then he seemed to be swept up by her. So I wanted this to work out. I understand why it went this way, and I understand the way it went down, because she needed to, I guess, ultimately be with Smith for a while, but Oh, this one, I don't know. Richard, it sucks here because we, I'll get to it when it happens, but this is the one, remember, where Richard is just about to say he wants to be monogamous with her and then, yeah, finds out that she and JJ kind of hooked up in the bathroom. Shower uptown. We put the two shower scenes back to back because people are always talking about the fact that our show is stylized and heightened. And we thought, let's put a very stylized, heightened scene with Samantha, who's a stylized, heightened character. And then let's really show a real couple in a shower, just soaping up and talking about ordinary things. There's something else for you to chew on. How about Hawaii? As what, the 50th state? As in we get hitched. We grab a couple friends. One of the funny things about this scene is in one of the takes, after he says he punned, Sarah Jessica spontaneously slapped him. We didn't use that take, but every time we came back when she laughed right there, it was because she's still laughing about the fact that she had slapped him earlier. Wow. Yeah, didn't know that. Are we talking playfully slapped him? Amber Heard slapping? What are we talking? These two people, as actors, are so comfortable and fun together that they spent this time in the shower. The water was hot, but we used a lot of water. They're just in the shower together. Of course, they have clothes on. Okay, if this is your first commentary with me, well, welcome. Um, <laughs> if it's your 50th, sorry, I have to say this again, but this is Michael Patrick King, or as I like to call him, Michael Patrick Dickheads. Uh, favorite thing to do is to compliment Sarah Jessica Parker, not just a little bit, it's like she can do no wrong. Hence, that whole character, I think, is written that way because I don't know if he sees himself as her or is just completely obsessed with Sarah Joseph Parker or just some sort of combination of the two. But now, anytime John Corbett is on there, well, I love him too. I really do. Um, this is one of Michael Patrick King's favorite thing to do. Look at the chemistry between these two. And I just never thought there was chemistry between those two. She doesn't even make a word. She just makes a sound. Somehow says it all. The amnio scene has been in pretty much every female-based romantic comedy or comedy or drama from 1990 on. So when we got to this scene, we wanted to show that Miranda doesn't have the really traditional reaction. As a matter of fact, she has no reaction. And it perfectly typifies what we tried to do with the whole Miranda motherhood thing is that it doesn't come natural. Just because you have a baby growing in you doesn't mean you have a mother growing in you. Well, it's almost painful me for me to agree with Michael Patrick King here. I actually agree. I do like that they wrote Miranda this way. It feels authentic and... Everybody reacts to things differently, so sure. I mean, there's, I'm sure there's people out there that have been through similar things where you just can't, you don't feel things the same way. So I actually like that they wrote Miranda like this, but I also like later on when she feels the kick and the maternal stuff starts to kick in, so. In case I ever need to do it. We try to keep references to other art pieces out of the show. I begged for that American Pie 2 to go away. We could not get it out of the show. You don't want to be looking at this in the year 2070 and go, what's America Pie 2? But then on the other hand, wouldn't the scary thing be people watching American Pie 2 going, what's Sex in the City? You never know. This walk and talk is amazing because of Pat Field. That outfit is full on Pat Field. 
Oh, man, I was waiting for this. Do you know what he's talking about here? You, I know you know it. <laughs> You're a diehard fan like I am. This is that stupid outfit, probably one of Carrie's worst, where she's wearing the green polka dot skirt, and then her shirt is tied up, you know, right under her boob line, basically, and then her belt is just up on her belly, just hanging out there, not attached to anything. It's just... It's obnoxious. And then she's almost wearing some sort of like sea crown in her hair. It looks like seaweed. That's <laughs> I already recorded the Patreon for this one and talked about it being like seaweed in her hair. I hate it so much. It is one of a kind and Sarah Jessica pulls it off. She's wearing, if you're wondering, some sort of fabric tiara. Oh God, I have to go to the dentist. Okay, wait. I'm having a radical idea here. There's a horrible bridal shop a couple of blocks away. What I like about this scene is that it takes place on the Upper West Side, which is where Miranda actually lives. The bridal shop she's talking about is on the Upper West Side. We've all gone by there and all gone, ugh. And then Tasty Delight is a particular fetish of Julie and Elisa who wrote this episode. It's a very low-cal taste treat, lusted after by all the women writers in the writing room. I'll try one on, too. Woo! I love this. That's Alice Spivak. I don't know what the hell she's playing, but she has a problem. And the more I look at this, I think she might be having a problem with Sarah Jessica's outfit. She just doesn't like them on site. It's funny. So I read this scene a little differently, and maybe he is right. Maybe it's the outfit, but I just, I thought they were just over the top fakey, right? Like, I know we know that they're faking, like wanting to try on these dresses, but the way they were talking to her over the top about, I want bows, she wants poofy. I'm just thinking this woman probably saw through their bullshit. They're there just to be silly and try on dresses. Oh, we both are. We they had so much fun doing right this. The more I look at it, the more I see they're just like yip and yap, the Catskill <laughs> pregnant comedy team. Okay. Is this a lesbian wedding? Oh, no, 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 no. It's very straight-laced, conservative crowd. Sometimes oh, episodes <laughs> of Sex and the City are created around a particular <laughs> image or a scene, and then we build stories out. This is one of those scenes. The ideas of these two non-traditional women in these traditional outfits really was compelling to us, especially the silliness about the idea of being a bride. We knew that they would be brides, and we needed a scene that actually showed the idea of Carrie going from fun to fear, a physical representation of her fear of getting married, the worst scenario we could come up with, which would be her seeing herself as a traditional bride being suffocated by that role slash dress. Alan Taylor directed this episode, and I think he particularly brilliantly captured the anxiety and the madness and the choppy and the frantic pace of this. Basically, we asked Sarah Jessica to create this bride breakdown, and she did it beautifully. The Muzak is close to you, which we thought was funny. So this scene always bothered me, too. I understand where they're going with it, trying to show how Carrie's freaking out and it's sh taking over her... Like, physically, too. But all I could think of, think with me here, think Vicki Gumbelson, Real Housewives of Orange County, how every time they go on vacation, she hurts herself and needs an ambulance, or she's sick and needs an ambulance, and how many times she's been carried out on stretchers during vacations to heighten the drama and stuff. And that's the same vibe I got here, and I'm just annoyed by it. Miranda's reaction to this is, I think, the thing that sells it as terrifying. I can't do it. I can't get married. This is all your fault. How could you take her to that dump? It was an experiment. It went awry. Okay. Let's this scene is very so important to the Carrie story because she in this scene, she tries to explain it. to the girls, i.e. the audience, how and why she could have agreed to be married and then changed her mind. It was a very heated debate in the writing room whether she was allowed to back out, whether she wasn't allowed to back out. And we always knew from the beginning that we had to have her back out because Carrie, in our minds, was never going to be married that season. She needed to be the eternal single girl, and we wanted her to make a big mistake. We wanted to show how women are pressured by society into doing something subtly. And then Carrie is the one individual who basically says on our show, well, I don't care what the traditional role is. I can't be it. Okay, I'm going to sound particularly negative here, and I don't mean to, because I really do love Sex and the City in the original series so much. I hate and just like that, but that's beside the point. But seeing what he's doing here, he's spinning this thing to make Carrie the hero. 
instead of acknowledging that Hay quite possibly carries the asshole. If she actually felt like this, absolutely fine. Nobody has to do anything they don't want to do. You don't have to get married, but you also don't have to be an asshole. Make it all about yourself. Not be honest with Aiden and communicate with him. You know what I mean? Like, it all comes to a head here. If she had just been honest from day one, then we wouldn't be here. So, no, I don't see her as this hero that he sees her as. I see her as an asshole. Well, why aren't they speaking up? And that line, why aren't they speaking up, I think is really interesting because it really says a lot of people feel it just because they don't say it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. A man you love kneels in the street and offers you a ring. You say yes, that's what you do. Look, you get married, you hope for the best. It doesn't work out, you get divorced. You can take tap with Bojangles over here. No, I can't take a vow of forever and ever if what I mean is... It was constantly a struggle for us to have Carrie take care of herself and take care of Aiden at the same time. To have her be responsible for the commitment she made, but yet responsible to her feelings. What I like about the characters on this show is that they acknowledge the situation and then make fun of it themselves from a character comedy point of view, not necessarily from a joke writing point of view, that they know what they're doing. They know that they are in trouble, yet they still try to make themselves and each other laugh about it. The music in the background is a Hawaiian version of Tea for Two, which is a theme through the whole show. We just programmed. This is another example of cashing in on a history of a character to tell the audience that Carrie was having a very, very difficult time was to ask her to start smoking again. This is a bit of a cheat, but we decided that if she looked up and saw all bride magazines that the audience would get it. Some days you just have those kind of the world against you days. It's just kind of blowing my mind to hear him explain it like this. I don't see it as a world against you days. Like, it's just there. And she chooses that over her cigarettes. How is that the world against you? <laughs> God, this guy he drives me crazy. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and end it here. We'll pick up the second half of the next episode. So check back and watch that. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Am I alone here? Did you think Carrie was the asshole? Um, I love Aiden. I want to make that clear. It's not him. I just didn't love them together. I don't. It's just because Carrie bugs shit on me. I don't know. But thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And I will talk to you again very soon. Take care. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. <laughs>